Welcome to another foster dog vlog where I document my foster dogs. Today's video is gonna be the most important video that I have made to date. If you have any interest in your pet's nutrition, raw feeding, your pet's overall health, you need this video is gold because I am interviewing the one and only Rodney Habib, the pet nutrition expert extraordinaire dog obsessed dog dad af if you have any friends that have pets they need to see this video so make sure you share this video you have to sit down you need to watch this if you want your dog or pet to live as long as possible let's get into it right meow Get my webcam on. Well, hello. Hello, you're real. <laughs> uh, <it's, laughs> I'm real life. How are you? I'm doing good. I know that Absolutely. you're you're being busy, being Superman for dogs right now, and trying uh, to save yeah. all the lives. And your time <laughs> is so stretched, but I'm so excited to finally connect with you. It really means a lot. Oh, absolutely! I'm honored. I'm honored that you uh, that you taken the time out of your day to uh, to chat with me. Before we get started, um, for the like two people in the world who don't know who you are, who's watching this, <laughs> um, let me try to summarize Rodney Habib, and then you tell me if I'm right because I want to get I want to get this spot on. But Rodney, you are ultimate dog nutrition advocate, extraordinaire pet blogger, obsessed with helping other pet parents make sure that they're able to have the best nutrition for their pets. It's, did I get that right? <laughs> uh, you, well, you forgot Canadian, but everything oh, else Canadian. was like okay. 100% spot on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> How could I forget that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. Thank you. Um, it, it's always interesting because, I mean, in this day and age, we have to label ourselves. Right. And it's like, I don't know what the heck to label myself. Uh, we live in a in a very slashy culture today because you can be a plumber slash producer slash musician on the side. So I do have a lot of slashes. I, I know that I would never limit it to one thing. Uh, but reality is every time I've got to sit there and try to uh, uh, sort of label what the heck I do, it's basically I'm just uh, I'd like to think of myself as a digital storyteller. And yeah. like yourself, we're creators. Yeah. We have all of these apps and digital tools at our fingertips to be able to tell wonderful stories. So like those people in the olden days, I admire who just used to sit around fireplaces, or excuse me, around little fires. And there'd be like a campfire around a whole bunch of people. And yeah. they'd scare the heck out of people with stories. Today, we get to use a lot of digital tools. So uh, that is kind of the simplest way that I see it. And of course, on top of everything, uh, a giant pet parent who literally had infatuated with my, with longevity and, and having my pets as long, like I want to set every single major record there is out there for longevity for pets. If I know that a dog can live to be 31, then my dogs are going to live to be 40 because I, I won't even it. settle with 32. I love it. Ah, oh, I love it. You're just, your energy, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just contagious. I love it so much. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about raw feeding today, uh, more specifically around foster dogs. So you know that I foster rescue dogs. Um, yes, so what that means again, is I bring in abandoned dogs who are homeless or strays and I help them find homes. And just in the past year, I fostered over 34 rescue dogs, like in and out of the house. In and out, it's a lot. It's a wow. lot. And yeah. as, <laughs> as you can imagine, they come in. Uh, malnourished, they have skin problems, um, gut problems. Sometimes they're 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 facing death, you know, because they've just been abandoned and malnourished for so long. I want to make this be this piece of content right here be kind of a, an easy way for a jump start for pet parents, especially those in the rescue community. All of that to say, my question is, how do I get started in an easy way to have the most impact? If I may only have a dog for a week or, or a month or two two months. Yeah, that you know, you know, Rachel, that's a very loaded question. I mean, <laughs> reality is, um, it's probably the ultimate question that every single person in the exactly. world asks. Yeah. And we know today, unless you're living in a hole or you have no exposure to social media, that there's this giant raw food movement that you keep hearing right now that everybody's sort of. Um, cheering in the air, right? And the word raw food is a very scary word. I mean, reality yes. is I try not to use it as much as I can because I know that there's a huge perception around blood and guts and things of that nature. Yeah. But if you were to peel kind of these layers back, today on social media, you know, information can be very convoluted. It's either you have to do this 
or you have to do that. And if you're not doing this extreme side over here, then you're wrong. And if you're not doing this side over here, you know, you're, you're a terrible pet parent and what have you. And these were the things that every first time a pet owner is going to go through when they go on social media. I'm sure you're very familiar with that. (laughs) Digging through information, everything out there is so murky. Nutrition is literally, you know, my favorite quote of all time, there's three things that people go to war over, three of the most visceral things in the world, politics, religion, and nutrition. Yes. And I don't know if we will ever see eye to eye on this planet as a species as a whole in nutrition. If we can't if we can't come to a resolution on ourselves, ultimately, how on earth are we going to come to a resolution for canines? Yeah. So for me, the biggest thing was, okay, what does science have to say? What do the people around the world who are funding a lot of this money, uh, a lot of these big studies, what do they have to say on the matter? Uh, how much do we have to add of this or of that? What special ingredient or secret recipes are out there that's going to increase uh, my dog's lifespan? Now, even science itself is, is murky. The reality is you have uh, industry-funded science. So you've got pet food science on this side. And then you've got sort of you know third-party um, independent research over here, and those guys don't get along. Yeah. And so uh, to make this sort of intro to all of this science very easy for a lot of these people out there, I understand that shelters today, um, for, first of all, everyone's on a budget. Yeah. And reality is not everyone has a zillion dollars. And in fact, to answer your question, uh, you know, it, here's the big one, right? This is actually worth one dollar here in, in, in the United States because in Canada, our money was nothing in the United States. <laughs> When they did research on what was the biggest issue, why people didn't either enhance their foods or go a little bit deeper into sort of fresh feeding, money. Money, yes. money was the biggest problem for a lot of people. And the second thing was afraid to balance. Mm-hmm. And so today we know that there's about a zillion hacks, food hacks, inexpensive food hacks that we can add into our bowls to make feeding better. And so... To address your question um, as to what are the things that we can do, I can tell you this. This is probably the biggest piece of advice I can kill you so I don't jack and hijack this entire question like I always do in my interviews. Is it literally if the the world's – by the way, I got a lot of props in here. You know, when I do a lot of my interviews – I was going to say, did you have the money to sit in there? I got got a lot of props here. Like over here on this side, I got props. Over here on this side. (laughs) Down on the ground, up on the window ledge. And I don't use half of it in all of my interviews. And a lot of people say, like, man, well, you use a lot of props. I'm actually a visual thinker. I'm a terrible reader. I'm a terrible writer. But, and I find most creators, in fact, 65% of the world population today are picture thinkers. So I like to use a lot of images when I'm doing, explaining things. Good. But the big thing is, one one of the major things that I was asking, and I had to travel all the way to Finland. The top PhDs down there, there's a, there's a team called the Dog Risk Group of PhD veterinarian scientists that wanted to answer the, the, the big million dollar question. How much would it take of a specific ingredient, primarily fresh food? So let's just say a piece of kale, for instance. How much would it take to, I know, right? Everyone just has a piece, a piece of, kale of kale lying kale. around. <laughs> in their, just, I, you know, I keep these in my back pocket everywhere I go. But how much would it take just to enhance food. Now, here was the greatest thing that, that you, I was told. You know, literally, it takes 20%. So 20%, if I was to come back and I was just to take a little bit of kale, like 20% kale, and I was to add something like that into my bowl. Now, don't judge me on that. I'm sure a lot of people would be like, that's not exactly 20%. Yeah. But he, but the actual theory behind it is that it just took 20% uh, in Finland of adding just a little bit of fresh food to a bowl of processed food to see benefits. And what type of benefits are those? They were actually measuring disease markers in dogs, two things called homocysteine and methionine, complex words, but two disease markers. Just by adding 20% of a little bit of fresh food to a bowl, decrease those disease markers. So the biggest tip I can I can throw in there before we get to the next question would be to add just 20% of something fresh live with moisture into a bowl of dry food, and you can see benefits. That's incredible. So it could even be bring a foster dog in and, and could even just t- you know throw in a little fish oil, MCT, some fresh berries, vegetables, things like that, which I know you've, I know you've talked about. 
Yeah, I have a huge fascination with a lot of those things, you know, uh, for and I, and I get I get a lot of phone calls from from people in shelters. And, you know, they ask me a lot of questions. I try to go visit as many shelters. I'm actually a, a foster fail myself. Uh, I got my That's little kind of failure. Uh, yeah, my little tiny miniature uh, husky shooby, whatever the heck she is. She comes up from up north. I'm not sure what the heck she is. I call her a broken husky because she's so tiny. I'm not I say miniature husky sometimes. And some of the breeders out there are like, what is that? Is that some sort of eccentric breed? I'm just like, well, no, she kind of looks like a husky and she doesn't grow anymore more than that. Um, but she was my, so sort of my foster fail there. And, you know, some of the big tips that you can actually, that actually give people without even having to add anything at all is how to make the food better. Because we know that a lot of shelters today, a lot of these foods are donated and sometimes they'll come from pet shops. I know a million pet shop owners uh, who may have these foods that are getting close to code. Um, and rather than throwing them away and they, the food is perfectly fine because a lot number on there shows two years, they'll donate foods like that. But one of the big things is, is we know that you could have a lot of issues with just keeping bags open. Yeah, and I would see some shelters just pouring the food in big giant like garbage bins and leaving it exposed where they would just kind of scoop and, and pour into the bowls. The problem is if these bags aren't sealed properly, and, and you know I've talked about this a million times, is that this food can go rancid. Yes. And it doesn't matter at that point what you're going to add glorious to the bowl, or if you're going to be chucking in kale or things like that into the bowl, is if the food is rancid, that in itself um, is a problem. So even a, a tip that would cost you no money, proper storage. Yeah, that's huge. That's absolutely huge. And um, you talked about adding kind of moisture to it because I think you talked once about um, the fish oils in the dry food. If it's not sealed properly, it actually just dries out. And so it's, exactly. it's not even it's not even ethic, like it's not good. So absolutely, yeah. that, that, that's a huge problem. You know what? What we don't realize. I mean, fish oil is probably one of my most favorite ads in the world. Yeah. Now, of course, I've got about a zillion things surrounded around me here to give people ideas and examples of things that they can add into their into their bowls of processed food, and I can go through those very quickly. But the the big one for me, of course, is fish oil. And why is fish oil so big for me? Well. First of all, we know that the seas are polluted. So one of the big questions and one of the biggest criticisms that you'll get when adding fish oil is, well, the seas are, are terribly murky. Um, and so there's a lot of people now selling like squid and um, a lot of these different forms of phytoplankton and all of these different types of forms of omega-3. I don't care what it is as long as you're supplementing some form of omega-3. And I'll tell you why. Um, first, of course, first and foremost, make sure it's clean. Look for somebody that does third-party validation testing on fish oil. Um, but do what you can afford, ultimately, at the end of the day. Check this out. This is one of probably one of my most favorite studies in the world. Um, so this is Dr. Anna Bjorgman's hand there in Finland. I accidentally jacked this, and I didn't tell her that I was going to do this. Here's a list here from, from greatest to least. The higher the value on that – can you see that good there? Yeah. So it's, it's oh, me yes. that can see that. Yeah. So the higher the value on that list, the more cancer that was developed. And on, way down on the bottom – um, was the least. Now, if you look there, if I zoom in pretty quick there, you'll read right there, it says omega-3 products. People that added omega-3 fatty acids into their diet, um, and this was a study done on 12,000 dogs, showed the least amount of cancer. So not only does it reduce inflammation, not only does it balance your omega-6s and omega-3s in your diet, but if shelters out there could buy like, you know, those big giant jar of fish oil, like the capsules where you can go like to your big box store to buy, and just take a little tiny capsule, puncture it and squirt it on top of the food. Now you're adding fresh oils into that food. And so that even that in itself is a great food hack. A tiny little fish capsule might be cents, pennies ultimately. Yeah. And the benefits to that dog would be monumental. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I like how you approach this, right? Because it's it's not about go change everything. You're, you're making it manageable. Like you're saying, hey, 20% at, at minimum. Obviously, ideally, we, we work our way up and feed completely raw, but I love how you kind of make it in bite-sized form. So that's really appeasing to me. Yeah. I learned a lot. And one of the biggest things that you have to do as a creator today and to be a great creator is communication. Yeah. And, you know, I do, I do go online. I do see people being ridicule and judge for what they can afford. And reality is there are some people and this, this goes into any realm. It doesn't even have to be in the animal world where it's either this way or it's the highway. Yeah. And so we're not going to get anywhere in life. And reality is 96% of the world population are feeding processed food. Yeah. So we have to find, you know, teaspoons of ideas for people to 
inspire them to want to change that goal. The biggest problem today, and one of my favorite philosophers of all time, Jason Silva, I, message, I talk about him all the time, and I love Casey Neistat, by the way. I see the Billy gear that you're yeah, wearing Yeah, right I did that just for you, huge, eh? I'm a huge fan of Neistat. Uh, reality is, and I love this expression, that um, reality is coupled to perception. So what we perceive to be food is our reality. And so it's really interesting because if you were to just take a look at food, like if I was just to grab the number one selling bag in America, and this isn't to knock on anybody, but I mean, look, there's different colors in here for a reason. So if I was to take two colors and I was to show you, you know, I've got a green, there's like a, a green color and there's a brown color. Well, this, the perception here is that this is a vegetable. And the perception here is that this is meat. And so look, you got two different colors in that bag. And so for the general public, when you hold that there and you've got that bowl, well, they're like, I've got vegetables in my bowl. I've heard a million people say it. Look at the little green bits that I have there. It's not until you actually grab a piece of vegetable and you hold these two side by side, you change somebody's perception on what a vegetable actually looks like and how it functions. All of a sudden, the reality changes. So I think it's really, really, really important that we as Educated pet parents who've done a lot of research, who've read a lot of books, leaders are readers. You can't yeah. read enough to get that information. Um, we have to approach things in teaspoons because science will tell us that just even with teaspoons, just 20% of something small has a massive impact. My favorite study of all time, I, talk, I did it in my TED Talk, I talk about it and everything, was the fact that Purdue University wanted to find out just how impactful vegetables were and I know that I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but just by adding green leafy veg three times a week and just a little bit to a bowl of processed food and reducing some of that food, it lowered the risk of cancer, green vegetables, by 90% bladder cancer. That is a massive statistic. And when we want to talk about what the benefits of vegetables are, it's a very deep topic, yeah. but reality it is fiber. And so it slows yeah. down gastric digestion yeah. and it also slows down insulin release and it uh, helps slow down the spikes of blood sugars, which in itself will promote longevity. Yeah, that's incredible. That's the man question and all the, like these uh, interviews and podcasts, nobody's touched that. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I, I used to write for uh, like one of the largest nutrition magazines that was out there. I used to uh, host my own podcast show here in Canada and I used to do all of these things and I was always under the impression that everything sort of had to be pureed to get full digestibility in an animal. And so, yes, you know, I'm a huge, I'm a huge, huge fan. Look, I brought a bag with me here of fermented vegetables. So you see kind of like how mushy that looks right in there. Yeah. Fermented vegetables, if you have the budget and the money, I mean, just the amount, I mean, these are organic, just the amount of enzymes, the activity, the cellular activity that happens in fermented vegetables. We know that the sugars are, are sort of, uh, uh, are reduced inside right. fermented vegetables. We know the toxins and things like that that come out of it. A lot of animals will benefit from just the probiotic, uh, the probiotic aspect to this. So it, it creates a lot of diversity in the microbiome. Mm -hmm. So my, I always thought, and if you get the opportunity to feed fermented vegetables, do it. It's rock stars. Okay. I actually had a combination of both, and I'll tell you why. And this is kind of new science versus old science. Um, that dogs, of course, and cats, we know they're all the carnivores. Uh, they can't produce the MLAs, they say, in their saliva glands uh, to sort of break down uh, you know, the fibrous effect of veggies. And the same way they go in is the same way they come out. Agreed. But it wasn't until I started working with Keto Pet, the, mm -hmm. you know, the groundbreaking sanctuary yeah. in, in Austin, Texas, and their top metabolic doctors, they were actually – they were ripping these into like cutting them up into tiny pieces. They weren't chopping them. So they, I mean, they weren't just chucking this on top of a bowl of kibble and saying to the dog, here you go, dog. Um, no, they were, they were chopping them up into little tiny fine pieces. And what they were finding was that if finely chopped, you were getting that fibrous effect from the vegetable. So the second they got into the GI system, it helped slow down the, uh, the, the blood sugar spikes and the insulin release from protein and from carbohydrates. And so one of the biggest things for me, of course, that I learned was I had no idea that the body, uh, the, uh, that there was a whole bunch of insulin that was churned out of the body because of gluconeogenesis and protein. But we know that pet food is very high in carbs and very high, uh, and some pet foods can be also moderately high in protein. Just chopping up vegetables, finely chopped, uh, sort of reduce those uh, blood sugar spikes. So to answer your question, which is a great question, and I'm sure very controversial, and there'll probably be about a million comments under this where people are like, oh, no, you, they're not going to fully digest them if you don't blend them and whip them up. Yeah. 
you can get wonderful effects just by finely chopping. And the way yeah. to validate that is a glucometer. Yeah. An $8 glucometer tests your dog's blood sugars, which I highly urge everybody should out, should do out there because you know the lower the blood sugars, the research and science shows you'll actually increase longevity and you'll actually prevent like cancers and diseases. Try it. It doesn't hurt. Chop up the vegetables the way you want to do them. Juice them, puree them, add them to the food, and test your dog's blood sugars. There's your easiest way to validate. There you go. I love it. I love it. And again, it's more attainable, right? Like, Are you saying that it's maybe – ideally better to puree but if you can only just chop it's still almost as good is that kind of what you're thinking i think, I think there's a, probably a combination oh my gosh that was amazing i hope you guys love this video and i hope you love rodney as much as i do he is by far my pet nutrition idol he's an incredible human being um, all of his documentary and social media links will be linked down below go check him out go show him some love um, and if you love rescue puppies I mean if you really love rescue puppies don't leave this video without giving it the biggest thumbs up smash that link button down below click subscribe I hope that you have a beautiful day goodbye Pan out. No, you're. Turn the camera off. Turn, turn, turn the. Okay, let's go.